Hello, families in the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District. My name is Paul Jovalos, and I'm the Director of Student Services here in Bridgewater Rainham. And I'm going to do a, a town hall style presentation around uh, supports for students with disabilities uh, across the district. Uh, this town hall meeting um, and, the, and the content um, basically came from a special education parent advisory council survey that was sent out to families to try to gather feedback on what are uh, some areas of concern or areas that, that require some more information uh, that we can help to provide in a bit more depth aside from the, uh, the fall reopening plan that was posted to the, to the district website. Uh, we're gonna go in a bit more uh, depth on a, a number of topics and hopefully provide uh, a lot more information for the families of our students on uh, IEPs or our students who are on 504 accommodation plans. So uh, if you haven't reviewed the uh, fall reopening plan, uh, the full district-wide plan on the, dis on the district website, uh, please do so. It has a lot of information about uh, the overall you know, uh, models of instruction that we're going to be utilizing across the district and a lot of information around uh, supports for our students with disabilities. Um, and we'll provide a lot more overarching information, so please review that if you haven't already. But overall, um, as you're you know, likely aware, our uh, Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District School Committee voted for our students to return, uh, for the most part, in a hybrid model of instruction for the, the coming school year. Now, we did also give families the option of selecting fully remote. Uh, families still have the option of choosing homeschooling. Um, and uh, there are a lot more uh, intricacies to that, to that hybrid um, instructional model, uh, which I'll explain further. But those are, in general, the, the overarching um, you know, learning models that we're engaging in for the 2021 school year. Um, for those families that selected fully remote instruction uh, in grade K through five, um, the students who opted for fully remote or BR at home as we're calling it, are gonna be engaging in instruction with a Bridgewater Rainham teacher via Google Classroom. And our fully remote students in grades six through 12 are going to engage in an online learning management system uh, through a platform called Edgenuity. Now those grades six through 12 students will still have a, um, both a, a special ed teacher and a, a general education teacher who are assigned to them to help to support them. But all of their content work is gonna be through that Edgenuity platform where they'll have um, all their uh, educational activities and all their um, you know, content will be, will be driven through. Now, as part of our um, hybrid instructional model, uh, we had three um, cohorts of students that, that were created, uh, cohort A, cohort B, and cohort C. Our cohort A and cohort B students are engaging in two days of in-person learning and three days of remote learning uh, on um, different schedules, uh, which I have on this slide here. So for our cohort A students, they're in-person on Monday, Tuesday, and remote on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And for our cohort B students, they're engaging in remote instruction on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and in-person instruction on Thursday and Friday. Now, uh, one of the main areas of questions that we've received from families is around the criteria for cohort C and what cohort C uh, looks like for students, uh, as that is our cohort of students who is the most, uh, uh, has the most potential uh, for not being able to make progress or has the most severely impact if they were to do remote learning. So we, uh, so cohort C is our uh, attempt to provide those most at risk students with the most in-person instruction uh, as we were able to. So you'll see on this chart that our cohort C or our high need students uh, engage in in-person instruction on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then on Wednesday, our special education and preschool uh, cohort C students also engage in a half day of in-person instruction and a half day of remote instruction. Uh, now our cohort C parents, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the makeup of that cohort C group uh, in, in just a couple minutes, but our cohort C um, families have been given the option of opting out of cohort C and selecting to, you know, to access uh, cohort A or B. Um, uh, they could select that hybrid model. You know, some have done so because they have uh, safety concerns with their with their child being back in person um, on a higher frequency time. Um, they we have some families who feel like their students engaged really well with remote learning, so they opted out of cohort C, so their students could be remote learners or opted for the hybrid model uh, to select cohort A or B because they felt like that <coughs> remote model was really beneficial for their child. So uh, families did have the option of opting out of cohort C. 
or uh, families have the option of guiding how much inclusive opportunities their cohort C student had, even though they are going to remain fully in person. So maybe they only wanted their you know, cohort C student included with uh, mainstream peers on Mondays and Tuesdays, as opposed to, you know, for the, um, you know, for four days a week. Uh, so we gave families that option. Um, and before I uh, explain a little bit more about the makeup of our, our cohort C group, um, we also have students who are homeschooled, who are being offered in-person or remote itinerant services that align with the day-to-day the -day schedules as, as they would experience them in their uh, home district building. Um, those itinerant services uh, could be provided for the coming year either in person uh, or remotely, but we do have a number of students with disabilities who are opting for that homeschooling model. Uh, so I definitely want um, that, uh, that group to know that they are uh, eligible to continue to receive special education services on an itinerant basis as well. Um, uh, Additionally, special education liaisons are going to have caseloads and have students who are in each instructional model. So you may have, for example, an inclusion special education teacher at the Williams School who has students on her caseload who are homeschooled, uh, who are opting for fully remote, or who are in person, uh, either um, you know through that you know through either uh, cohort in that in that hybrid model. Now, a little bit more specifically um, around how our cohort C. Uh, group was was configured altogether, and uh, also um, specifically, you know how to, you know how we determined our cohort C special education students, you know would be, you know would be um, would be developed. This um, guidance uh, for us actually came through the Department of Education, which um, implored us to consider the students who were our special education students, our homeless, foster, or congregate care students our English language learner students, our preschool students, the um, cohorts of students who would be the most susceptible to you know, not being able to make progress under a remote model. And that's not to say that all students you know, don't, have a, don't have their own individual level of need, but the Department of Ed called upon us to, to set some, some priorities and to set some clear criteria uh, and offered us that, you know, some guidance on how to do that uh, in you know, how we created our cohort C. So we did choose to you know, select our homeless, foster, and congregate care students as being part of cohort C. All of our preschool age students are part of cohort C. Uh, all of our students who are English language learners who scored between a one and a three on uh, the WIDA assessment, which is a, uh, an assessment that we use to gauge the progress of our English language learners, uh, were uh, made a part of cohort C. And then as far as our special education um, students go, not all special education students are naturally part of cohort C. Only our students who are a part of our substantially separate special education programs across the district are our are, are cohort C special education students. And how you can see, you know, if your child is a substantially separate uh, special education student is uh, part of the IEP packet that you get uh, looks like the, the picture that I have um, copied up on the screen here. That's the placement page. That's one of the pages that you sign off on that indicates the placement for your for your child here in the district and you'll see that the choice options for our, our in-district students are full inclusion partial inclusion and substantially separate so uh, a small population of our our special education students across the district fall into this substantially separate category and those are the students who experience most of their learning in a small group separate setting over the course of their day um, so uh, once again, th this decision, you know, isn't meant to diminish the concerns that families have uh, for their children. Uh, it's, you know, we're, you know, we're just you know, needing to set a criteria and needing to set, um, you know, um, following DESE guidance, uh, Department of Ed guidance, um, a criteria by which we identify the students that are most have most severe needs and who are most at risk uh, for not being able to access. Um, remote instruction. And that level of need is determined, uh, again, by the percentage of time that the student spends in the general ed classroom. So for the majority of our, oops, the majority of our special ed students, they're primarily in their general ed classrooms over the, over the course of the, of the day. Uh, or um, they're primarily receiving instruction from special education teachers and general ed teachers over the course of their day. Or the majority of our students in the district are you know, receiving special education services for a relatively small percentage of their day. It's the students who really only engage with special education teachers and service providers over the course of their day, really, um, for the most part, only spend time in those small group, substantially separate classrooms, and who really um, 
have the majority of their day made up by, you know, by special education services are the students who qualified for cohort C. Um, so those were the things that we took into account and how we gauged which students were high needs and, and um, opted for, you know, the decision that our substantially separate special education students were going to be the students, you know, who are, you know, um, uh, placed in this cohort C where they receive five days of uh, in-person instruction uh, as we, you know, as, you know, is listed on the, on the bottom of this chart. Um, so our cohort C special ed and preschool students would be in, you know, in district receiving in-person instruction on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and then would receive uh, um, two and a half hours of in-person instruction on Wednesday mornings, and then would um, have remote um, instruction for uh, Wednesday afternoon. So again, uh, this is this has probably been one of the most frequently asked questions by families uh, over the course of the past um, you know a month and a half or so, um, and I hope that that explanation provides a little bit more clarity. And, and also, I just want to say you know more personally, which I've said to families who have asked questions about cohort C, um, just because your child's on an IEP and not in cohort C uh, doesn't mean that we're diminishing your your concern or or not concerned for your child. Um, this was a, a criteria that we, you know, that we, you know, were guided by DESI to the Department of Ed to implement, and you know, and then uh, implemented, realizing that every student in the district, uh, regardless of whether it's a student with a disability or whether it's a, a student who doesn't have a disability, uh, is going to have, you know, have been substantially impacted by, you know, the period of school closure last year. So all families are going to have concerns, and we understand that parents of students with disabilities are going to uh, even more so have those concerns, but we are going to support all those students and take seriously, you know, the reestablishing of educational momentum and the support from a social emotional learning perspective for all our students uh, and all our students who don't necessarily fall into uh, cohort C. Uh, and, you know, it was not a choice made to, you know, to not take into account those concerns, but more so to align with the guidance that we were given and to recognize that there are students here in the district who have a very severe level of need, and we have to put that into perspective and, and approach that, you know, in a in a relative way. So I also want families to to really um, have a, a good heads up and a good knowledge of what to expect uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks as far as our reopening um, plan goes, and as far as uh, some of our special education uh, processes. You're going to continue to have a special education teacher or related service provider who's going to continue to oversee the IP for your child and really be your uh, your your primary contact person. The liaison is going to be reaching out to you uh, either next week, the week of September 7th, or the week after, the week of September 14th, to gather input from you regarding the delivery of services and also get feedback from you regarding your remote learning experience from the spring of 2020. Now, this is, um, you know, we, we're doing staff meetings with all of our special education staff and we're relaying to them the importance of them communicating with families and how 90% of the concerns from, from the spring could easily have been rectified by just establishing good communication between uh, teachers and, you know, and families. Now that um, burden of that communication and the burden of speaking up if there's a, something that's not working well for your son or daughter falls upon all of you as well. You know, I, I really feel like that strong communication between the special ed uh, teacher liaisons or related service providers and families is going to really be what carries us through this, this difficult time. If something's not working particularly well, let one of the special ed teachers know. Over the next couple of weeks, as the special ed teachers reach out to you for your input, please be honest and, and open with them about what worked well and what worked, you know, what didn't work so well uh, regarding remote learning. After the liaisons have collected that feedback and connected with families, uh, it's going to be the special ed liaison's responsibility to craft a COVID-19 special education learning plan uh, specifically for, for each child on, a, on an IEP. Now, that uh, special education learning plan is going to be a tool that describes how services are going to be delivered in a hybrid or in-person or remote model. Because we know that even though um, you know we're responsible to meet the, the service requirements on an IEP, that this remote learning structure or hybrid learning structure is naturally different than it is uh, on a on an in-person, you know, structure or in-person basis. So services may look differently than they would if they were being implemented uh, in person. So the goal of this plan is to describe how those services look different if they, you know, if they do look different in those hybrid or remote, you know, um, models of instruction. And this form is going to be based upon your feedback 
and based upon that connection and that communication that you establish with the special education teacher. So that's why that communication piece over the next couple of weeks is going to be so important um, and so essential to, you know, to this process. The, uh, the Department of Education uh, required us to complete these plans with input from families, so that was communicated out to all of our, our staff members uh, today. As I said, we're required to implement all services on an IEP, remembering that remote services may look you know, different or significantly different than in-person services. Now, the services in, um, in the descriptions in the COVID-19 special ed learning plans that are going to be um, created uh, don't require uh, parent consent to be implemented. Uh, it's understood that those are you know, um, required tools uh, that are gonna, you know, that are gonna be essential, um, you know, as we're as we're working through this uh, this period of hybrid or, or remote instruction, and they also, uh, importantly for you to know, do not impact the IEP. So just because this COVID nineteen special education learning plan is created and it describes, you know, how services are implemented, it doesn't impact or change the IEP. That basically stays and stay put until the team meets and and updates it. Um, so, uh, you know, just to, so it doesn't, um, it won't alter the IEP. It's something that works in reference to the IEP and in addition to the IEP to describe how um, supports are provided. Now, uh, we're focusing on uh, instruction and services um, rather than resources and supports for students moving ahead. Now, last year, you remember when we first you know, entered this period of school closure, you know, there were a lot of different messages from the Department of Ed as to what remote instruction needed to look like. And at first, remote instruction was just providing you know, um, resources and providing, you know, supports, like it could have been a packet of work that was sent home with students, but the criteria and the expectation for that, you know, is is increased now that we have, you know, less of an emergency period and a, and a reactive period of time to put these things in place, and we can be more planful around specific instruction and services, and structuring those instruction and services uh, to, you know, to mirror the services in, you know, in the IEP for students. So, um, the you know what that translates to you know to, to families to looking like is that whether a student's fully remote or in a hybrid model of instruction, the expectation is that the services are are structured that there's uh, instruction taking place you know for students, uh, and it's not just providing materials you know to be worked on at home, uh, which was you know what we were guided to do you know back in in March and, and early April you know that really took a shift towards you know needing to be more intensive as that period of school closure got longer and longer and now that we've had the luxury of the summer to plan for that for the you know for the fall uh, and I just probably you know can't say this enough you know just to say it again you know build relationships with your you know, with your uh, special ed teacher liaison with your related service providers who provide service to your you know to your uh, son or daughter you know, in that relationship and that communication back and forth is gonna be very, very important to, you know, your child's success. So please, you know, uh, run with that. And and that say, you know, I gave that same message to our special education uh, staff, you know, in the, the staff meeting presentations over the course of this week as well. So another very frequent question, you know, that, that came up, you know, through our, um, uh, the you know the uh, excellent um, survey that was put out by our special education parent advisory council was I, I'd like a little bit more information about what each instructional model is actually going to look like in terms of service delivery for my for my child as they as they navigate all these different you know potential options so uh, I'm going to do my best to describe that in a little bit more depth today but realistically uh, student supports are individualized they depend on so many factors including the IEP itself the format of services in a building, uh, your input as families, uh, and scheduling and and resource availability within within our building. So there are so many factors that go into what your child's IEP might look like over the over the start of the school year uh, that it's impossible for me to describe every every single you know scenario in you know in detail for you. But I'm going to try and give as best a picture as I can of each of those different instructional models and and what that might look like for students. Um, uh, and again, communication with your special education teacher liaison around what services look like and how those being provided are going to be your first, you know, go-to and your first conversation that you're having over the next couple of weeks. Um, so, um, any questions about that over the course of the school year? That should be your first line of defense is going to special education um, or related service provider contact person. Excuse me. So. 
Uh, let's start with our uh, homeschool uh, instructional model. Some families have opted for their uh, son or daughter who has a 504 or an IEP to engage in a homeschool model. Now that homeschool model means that that student has withdrawn from the school district and uh, is being educated at home. And uh, that student continues to be eligible for their special ed services uh, or, um, you know, uh, or uh, supports provided through a 504, um, but on an itinerant basis. Now, since remote instruction is an option for the coming school year, we those itinerant services can be provided for homeschool students on either an in-person or a remote basis. So say we have a, a student who's homeschooled, who has speech, you know, one times 30 on their IEP, that student can engage in remote or in-person, you know, um, 30 minute session of speech with a speech pathologist who would continue to have that student on his or her caseload. Now, the scheduling of that session would fall whenever it would naturally schedule, you know, during the course of the day for that student. So say the speech, speech pathologist had that student scheduled for noon on a Wednesday to receive their half hour of speech in that week. That would be when it would continue to occur either in person or remotely, and the family would work to, you know, to have the student access that if they, you know, if they chose to. Now, that family can also choose to not access those special education services and opt out, and that's totally, you know, at their discretion. So the next instructional model that I'd like to describe is our remote instructional model. So we gave families across the district the option of uh, opting in to uh, what we call BR at home, which is our fully remote model for, for families that chose to access that for you know, whatever health or personal family reasons that they felt like that was the best um, in the best interest of their child and their family. That BR at home model, as I said before, for our K to five students would mean that those students would be linked with a, uh, a general education teacher, a, you know, a grade level teacher who is going to just teach that remote cohort of students uh, at the K to five level. For the grade six through twelve level, that remote cohort of you know of students, those uh, families who have se selected remote for those students, are going to be having their students engage in uh, a learning platform called Edgenuity, uh, where. Uh, for grades six through eight and for grade nine through 12, we have a special education teacher who is just gonna focus in on those grades six through eight and then those grade nine through 12 fully remote students and helping them to um, receive the accommodations and modifications they need in that Edgenuity remote learning environment. Now, we have a number of students who are uh, substantially separate students across the district whose families have opted for remote, fully remote instruction as well. Those substantially separate special education students are going to be continuing to be linked with their substantially separate special education classroom, and we're going to provide those uh, substantially separate special education uh, classrooms with the technology they need to help those students have both a, a synchronous and asynchronous remote learning experience and continue to be linked with those um, special education classrooms so that they can receive their, you know, their, service, their services um, through that model as well. Now, um, for our students at the high school level, uh, our high school content is delivered through courses. So it's not as though students are, you know, uh, part of a, a small uh, cohesive, you know, educational team, uh, like, um, you know, a team of uh, social studies, science, math, and ELA teachers like you'd find at the middle school. And it's not like at the elementary level where those students would be with one um, general education teacher for the, over the course of their day. At the high school level, our special education students take uh, courses and our special ed teachers teach courses over the course of their day. So it isn't that same teamed approach or, or one room schoolhouse approach as it is at the elementary and middle school uh, setting. So for our students who opted for fully remote who are our high school special education students, if they have any C grid courses that they're taking, so small group substantially separate courses that they're taking, like say a student who is taking a small group um, special education geometry course at the high school. We're going to give those students the opportunity to continue to take that course remotely because uh, Edgenu the Edgenuity platform doesn't have any C grid or a substantially separate small group learning environment. It's a general education platform. So we want to make sure we give those students the opportunity to access that small group instruction that they need um, through, you know, through um, you know, that uh, synchronous or asynchronous learning with that teacher who teaches that course or with that teacher in that substantially separate special education program. 
Now, probably most complex of all, uh, and our, our last instructional model that I'm going to, to describe to you uh, is our hybrid instructional model. Now, you'll remember from the, the chart that I put up on the screen uh, earlier that for cohort A and cohort B students, they're gonna receive two days of in-person instruction and three days of remote instruction as part of cohort A or as part of cohort B. Now, what that means at, uh, for our special education students in cohort A or B is that their services are gonna be delivered in a mixture of both remote and in-person services. So it's gonna be our priority to provide as much in-person services to students on the two days that they're in school as possible. But realistically, for some of our students who have uh, higher frequencies of service, some of that is gonna to need to come um, in, a, in a remote or a asynchronous uh, environment as well. So we're going to have our uh, uh, educational support professionals, our ESPs, uh, which is what we call our paraprofessionals here in the district, also support students on remote days and um, have our special education teachers provide a mixture of both in-person and remote services over the course of their, their five days um, you know, in district. So special education teachers are gonna try to provide as diverse you know, um, a daily routine so that they can help both in-person and remote students you know, day to day and try to meet and juggle all needs. For our hybrid students in cohort C, um, uh, as I described before, the uh, cohort C special education and preschool students are gonna be in the building for five uh, days in person, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and two and a half hours on a Wednesday morning so that uh, we can maximize for that most vulnerable population as much in-person instruction uh, as possible. Now, um, uh, some you know more scenario-based questions that have come up, like uh, say for example, you know we have a student who has uh, three times 30 speech and language uh, in, included in, in their IEP. Now that student is only in person, you know, um, if they're in cohort A and B, two, two times, you know, two days uh, per week. So parents have asked, well, how do you provide three times speech if my child's only in person for, you know, two days out of the week? And the answer to that would be that it would likely be a mixture of in-person and remote services that would be provided. Um, and those remote services that could be provided may be asynchronous, which means the pre-taped lesson or pre-taped uh, video. It might be uh, a pre-created activity that's already been tailored and modified you know, for that student that accounts for one of those sessions. But uh, that ultimately that service delivery requirement will be met, but it may just look differently, as I said uh, in, in previous slides. Um, uh, also, um, the level of uh, inclusion for, you know, for our hybrid students, uh, either in cohort um, A, B, or C, uh, has been something that families have been able to give feedback on. For example, if we have students who are in person for, um, you know, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, that would mean that those uh, students were um, being, you know, um, provided inclusive services. Uh, to, in, in both cohort A and cohort B. And some families have felt like that was a, a safety concern for them and opted to only have their students access inclusive services you know, for two days a week as opposed to the, to the four. Now, there are some students who have five times per week of inclusive services on their IEP. And given that Wednesday is a remote learning day for the majority of our students in the district, there won't be any uh, mainstream peers uh, in the district on Wednesday. So that Wednesday, um, there won't be those uh, inclusive opportunities just because there are no mainstream peers in the building. Uh, so, you know, just, you know, uh, intuitively, there isn't that opportunity, um, you know, for that fifth day for, for that inclusive uh, or that, um, you know, uh, mainstream opportunity for, for students. So um, that's uh, about as best as I can do to describe those different instructional models to you. Um, uh, you know, given the, you know, given the, the different, um, you know, circumstances that, you know, that, that, uh, that we have, uh, and given the fact that it's also individualized and also dependent on the, on the work that your special education teachers do and the work that, you know, you, and the input you give as families, that it's, it's kind of impossible to account for every circumstance, but hopefully me talking through the different instructional models and giving a little bit more description on what they, you know, what they may look like uh, was, you know, was, uh, you know, was, was helpful in, in that regard. 
No. Um, moving on, uh, our evaluation processes across the district, whether it be special education evaluations or 504 evaluations, are going to you know to resume once we start school, um, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks. Now, from the uh, period of school closure last year, we are uh, operating under a you know a pretty significant backlog since we weren't able to test students in person uh, during that period um, of of spring, you know, um, last year. So the way we're going to approach that is uh, operate basically on a you know first come first serve and start working towards those. Um, meetings and those evaluations that were missed in the springtime and work through those and continue to gain ground on the um, the new or the or the pending uh, evaluations that that come up from either a special education or a 504 uh, perspective uh, we did uh, work over the summer to try to complete as many evaluations as as we could uh, for you know for uh, some of our students um, at buildings where we had the greatest backlog uh, we do have uh, team members that even during these couple initial PD weeks are, are trying to get students in to complete evaluations, um, you know, to, to alleviate some of that backlog. And we are going to, you know, continue to work to do our best with that. But that natural, you know, backlog did, did occur because we weren't able to see students in person, um, you know, during the, you know, the, the height of the pandemic and school closure uh, last year. Um, it's uh, really important to, to note that, you know, um, we need to, you know, um, we're going to have all students in the district who are impacted by this period of school closure. So our school psychologists, our speech pathologists, our clinicians who complete evaluations, our special ed teachers really need to be focused on supporting students as they return. And uh, where, you know, we do need to complete the evaluations that, you know, that are, that are required of us, um, I want to make sure that we're completing evaluations that are, you know, uh, procedurally, you know, uh, accurate and valid. So you know, um, prompting an evaluation for, you know, for your child because you feel like they lost ground during the period of school closure is not really an accurate use of the, the special education or 504 evaluation process. All students, you know, are going to have had the potential to have lost ground due to the period of school closure. And all students are going to require a lot of support coming back, a lot of support in gaining momentum, a lot of social and emotional supports. Um, but that doesn't mean that those are necessarily students who have disabilities. And that's the criteria for you know, um, conducting a 504 or a special education evaluation is the suspicion that there's a disability that's pervasively impacting a student's ability to access, you know, access learning. Um, and, you know, and I, I just want families to, to think about the fact that we're operating on a, a new baseline across the district. We're operating on a higher level of need for just all our students across the district and that that doesn't necessarily mean that all those students have developed you know disabilities that are impacting their learning and i want to use our evaluation processes for what they're intended for so that those service providers can be free to support all students including you know the students who have lost ground um, you know through the you know, through the period of school closure last year so that's just a, a really important piece to me and speaks to the efficient use and the efficient implementation of services and how we can support as many students as best as we can across the district by really focusing in on that criteria um, specifically for our uh, families of students on 504 plans uh, 504 plans and the 504 processes will continue starting in September uh, when we return to our buildings uh, I don't want people to worry if the um, their child's 504 plan um, has a date that expired. We're continuing to operate off those 504 plans as stay puts. Those accommodations will continue to be in place. And additionally, uh, if students selected fully remote uh, instructional models or if students are in hybrid instructional models, um, then those students are still going to have access to their 504 accommodations and it continues to be our responsibility to communicate those 504 plans to the teachers who are going to be working in those students um, in those different instructional models so if your child's a, a fully remote student on a 504 we will have sent that 504 to their remote general education teacher so that that teacher is aware of that student's needs and the accommodations that are that are required uh, so I'm currently in the process of sending 504 lists, building by building, to principals, assistant principals, school psychologists, and nurses, ensuring that they know who their students on 504s are, and that that it's our responsibility to communicate those 504s to either in-person teachers or our remote teachers. Uh, 504 plan implementation and monitoring forms are a tool that we use uh, to ensure that 
uh, all the stu all the um, service providers working with a student have reviewed the 504. Uh, we ask them to sign off on that and we keep that on file. Uh, we do the same for our IEPs across the district. Our special ed um, teacher liaisons uh, use those implementation and monitoring forms to ensure that all service providers, general ed teachers, related service providers, ESPs are um, you know, documenting that they have reviewed those, those really important documents. Uh, and that's a system that we have uh, in place across the district. Um, uh, um, depending on the you know the building you know where your where your children attend, it may be a guidance counselor, school psychologist, nurses, or assistant principals who are a part of the 504 process uh, in individual school buildings. And also depending on the individual needs of your your son or daughter, uh, if your son or daughter has a primarily medical condition prompting uh, individual health care plan, it would be the school nurse uh, in your building who's the contact person. If it's more of an academically based. Um, need. It might be the school psychologist, guidance counselor, or assistant principal. Uh, guidance counselors operate mainly at the high school. At the uh, pre-K through 8 level, it's mainly our school psychologists and our assistant principals who, who uh, navigate the 504 and help families to support through the 504 uh, plan process, uh, whether it be the evaluation process or the writing of the 504s uh, and the eligibility determinations themselves. Uh, also wanted to provide some just general updates and, and general information um, that uh, apply to some of the questions that were you know that were brought up in the in the um, uh, special ed parents advisory council survey as well. Uh, a lot of questions have come up around uh, transportation safety and um, parent support of the of the district around transportation. So if uh, special education students or 504 students have uh, transportation uh, written into their IEPs or 504s, they continue to be eligible to receive that transportation through the district. We are uh, imploring families and really asking families that, you know, because of the social distancing requirements on our vans, uh, just like because of the social distancing requirements on our buses, uh, is causing us to have to spread out students and it's really uh, taxing the uh, transportation, you know, routes and, and taxing the transportation process here in the district. So we're asking families, if you're able to transport your child to and from school, uh, we're, we're just imploring families to please do that in an effort to, you know, to help the district. Uh, if it is a special education or 504 uh, student who has transportation written into their IEP, a family who chooses to transport is eligible for mileage reimbursement as well um, if they opt to, to transport their child uh, under this, this difficult circumstance that we have. So uh, if your child has van transportation written into their IEP and you're able to transport them to and from school, uh, we would you know, provide you with mileage reimbursement and we'll send out a process and information around that. Uh, we did that for uh, you know, quite a few families over the, over the course of summer and it worked out really well. Uh, so we're just asking families to consider that. Um, and then from a transportation safety perspective, we're following all social distancing guidelines on our vans as we are in our buses. The vans have um, their specific um, cleaning schedule and um, um, drivers, monitors, and students are gonna be asked to wear masks on the van. We realize that you know, there, there are a lot of students who you know, who we work with um, who are not able to wear masks on the van, which means we would have to go with a, a more intensive uh, distancing policy for, for those students. Um, but uh, a lot of our students, you know, even with, you know, more severe needs are doing really well with, uh, with wearing their masks. It's, it's been really encouraging and really great to see. Um, and it's becoming more normalized and less, you know, of a, a source of anxiety for, for our students across the district um, as well. Um, uh, another topic uh, coming up on the horizon is that uh, as a school district, we're going to be asked to create a process and a procedure around considering whether uh, compensatory services are, are required for students uh, because of the period of school closure last year. So we're uh, continuing to work on that procedure um, based upon the, the Department of Ed guidance that we received. Um, but uh, consideration of compensatory services has to come from a failure of the district to implement uh, services uh, for a student. So say there was a student who should have received uh, a half hour of speech um, last year uh, per week. Um, and for some reason that, you know, that half hour of speech was just, you know, um, you know, just overlooked, you know, uh, which I would hope wouldn't happen, but, you know, just for the purposes of this example, was just overlooked and not uh, implemented. There was no attempt to reach out to the family to schedule that service. That would be an example of something that was just missed by the district that would be, uh, you know, um, require compensatory services. 
Now, the Department of Ed has also guided us as a school district to come up with a plan to provide uh, support services to any student, not necessarily a student with a disability. Excuse me, with an opportunity to provide um, you know, remedial instruction, just because every student, like I said, had, you know, will, you know, potentially have lost ground because of the period of school closure. Um, uh, we are, you know, actively working on that general approach as well, but this compensatory services consideration that's most applicable to our special ed students is around that potential failure by the district to, to implement a, a special education service. And more details around that procedure will be coming out. Um, we also have to look at whether uh, there's the potential that a student developed a new area of disability uh, due to the period of school closure or due to a, a particular trauma or something, you know, uh, difficult or, or life-changing that occurred during that period of school closure. So those will all be considerations and, and just something that I wanted to, you know, uh, share with families that, that we're in the process of, of working on. Um, uh, the next topic I'd like to talk about is our um, you know, a lot of families have shared uh, medical information or medical based concerns with, you know, with me or with uh, the special ed teacher that they that they work with. But if you have medical information to, to share with the school team, you should also make sure to be sharing that with the, the school nurse at your at your students, um, you know, individual building. The school nurse would then, you know, help you to understand the, you know, the supports, you know, or the, um, you know, accommodations that are, you know, that are in place and the safety procedures that are in place or, or necessary based upon that medical documentation and, and information that's submitted. So, uh, please don't forget to include your your school nurses when you're submitting that, you know, that type of information to, you know, to any a member of the school team. Um, uh, we have um, gone ahead and. Um, you know, made sure that we're going to be taking a supportive approach to, to mask wearing for students. Soon we're going to try to educate and support students to understand, you know, or build capacity around wearing masks. We know that some of our students uh, who are younger or who have more severe disabilities may have you know, difficulty wearing the mask, but we're taking a very positive approach and a very supportive approach to trying to help build that capacity. And that approach, uh, you know, needs, needs to be mirrored at home too and, and supported at home too. So we're going to ask you to be partners in that, uh, which I'm sure, you know, many of you are, are, you know, actively working on with your, you know, with your children at home. Um, we've also uh, worked to uh, order um, protective equipment to help support our staff in being able to provide, you know, hand over hand instruction uh, and activities of daily living support to our students um, and maintain that high level of, of instruction, um, whether it's an individual or small on, on a small group basis. Uh, we you know, wanted our staff to have the you know correct personal protective equipment to be able to continue that you know that more um, you know important work with with students uh, as well. One uh, final piece of information that you know I really have uh, taken pride in over the course of the summer is the um, implementation of a, um, a committee over the summer that's focused on social and emotional learning and how to prepare our students, staff, and families for the um, for the return to school uh, in in just a couple of weeks. Uh, we developed uh, four subcommittees, you know, that work together on this social emotional health committee, uh, doing things like you know, creating uh, artistic, you know, materials um, to, you know, to display at buildings to welcome students back, uh, creating uh, and supporting um, videos that, that could be in place, um, creating a, a social emotional, um, you know, instructional framework and tiered framework for how all staff across the district can help support students from a social and emotional perspective returning to school. Um, and also, um, you know, very recently putting out a social emotional learning survey, which you all, you know, likely received and, and hopefully were, were able to respond to, to give us an accurate gauge of how families and how students are, you know, um, feeling from a social and emotional perspective across the district. That stat, uh, survey also went out to staff to get a, uh, a sense of, you know, how staff were feeling about the, the return to school and guide us to be able to support staff as well. Uh, from a social emotional perspective, uh, there are key contact contact people in each building who support uh, social emotional learning for students. Your, like I said, your first tier, your first you know go to person is your child's classroom teacher or your child's special education teacher, uh, who you you know who you would want to access as a as a support from a, a social and emotional perspective. Um, but in each of our buildings, we have uh, different types of clinicians who may be uh, resources and supports as well. 
Uh, at the Merrill Elementary School, we have both a school psychologist and a school adjustment counselor. At the La Liberty Elementary School, we have um, both school psychologist and school adjustment counselors. At the Raynham Middle School, uh, we have uh, school psychologists, school adjustment counselors, and a guidance counselor uh, who supports students. Um, at the uh, Mitchell Elementary School, we have a um, school adjustment counselor and school psychologist. At our preschool, we have a school psychologist. Um, at the Williams Intermediate School, we have uh, a school psychologist and a school adjustment counselor. At Bridgewater Middle School, we have a uh, school psychologist. And at the Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School, we have school adjustment counselors and school psychologists who are there to be you know, um, uh, and actually at the high school, also our guidance counselors, you know, play a really significant role in supporting students' social and emotional health as well. Um, so uh, just a myriad of different staff across the district, in addition to your building administrators who are, are charged with, you know, helping students to reacclimate and to, you know, be, you know, uh, feeling safe and supported uh, when they return. As I said before, it's uh, you know going to be a tall task for all our support you know team members, all our service providers across the district returning because we're returning on a on a new baseline. You know everyone's coming back with a little bit more anxiety, um, and you know we're trying to take a very positive approach to that and a very supportive approach to that. You know partly through the work by this uh, social and emotional um, learning uh, you know uh, committee that you know that we. Um, you know, uh, implemented over the summer, and uh, the graphic on the on the screen right now um, is actually the the motto or the you know the um, you know the the slogan that we created uh, to to return to school. And you're going to see this visually represented, and you know, and and discussed with students uh, as we're presenting it to staff in the next couple of weeks. You know, uh, and it's. Um, called We Are BR Strong. We are safe, we are taking care of ourselves and, and each other. We are ready to learn, we are open to new ideas, we are navigating this together, and we are grateful for our community. So we wanted to um, come up with that and some activities around that, you know, to, you know, to reassure and to set off the year on a really positive tone. So um, that is uh, all the, you know, the content and the information that I have for you today. I wanna say again, you know, as I said, it, uh, you know, 100 times during this presentation, communication is going to be essential and, and very vital, um, you know, to, you know, to, to, you know, helping us all work through this, you know, this pandemic and, and providing for, a, you know, a, a strong education, a free appropriate public education for students during this pandemic. So please keep those communication lines open. That communication goes, you know, goes both ways. If something isn't working well or is work, working well, share that. Um, and and please let your special education contact people know. Uh, uh, you know, a reminder again across the district, we have uh, four special ed uh, administrators who work across the district. Uh, there's myself, um, uh, who uh, mainly oversees the high school and our therapeutic day program, uh, in addition to, to overseeing the entire district. Uh, and then there's uh, Kate Parker, who works at our uh, buildings on the Bridgewater side of the district, so Mitchell, Williams and Bridgewater Middle School, and then uh, Ms. Dina Medeiros, who works on the Rainham side of the district, who oversees our preschool program, our Merrill Elementary, our La Liberty Elementary, and our Rainham Middle School uh, programming, and then Caitlin Morelli, who is the main contact person for our out-of-district um, students and families, and also the contact person who um, uh, helps to support our homeless, foster, or congregate care students, and also our liaison to the courts around um, child requiring assistance petitions and uh, you know truancy concerns. So, you know, as an administrative team or as a building level team, you know, please keep that communication open. And I hope that you found the the content of this presentation, um, you know, this evening or today, you know, uh, very helpful to you in providing a bit more information around uh, special education and 504 services for our kids with disabilities across the district. And uh, a thank you again to our special ed parents advisory council for uh, prompting that survey that gathered a lot of the the questions and concerns that that led to, you know, creating the content for this for this presentation today. Uh, I hope everybody is staying safe and everybody is as excited as I am for the for the return to school. Uh, really looking forward, you know, as are, are all my colleagues to seeing students back in our buildings. Uh, it's really uh, reinvigorating for us and, 
you know, and, um, you know, just, uh, you know, making those those connections that are so important uh, for all the members of our team here in the district uh, is just, um, you know, I envision, gonna, you know, to be wonderful. And I think that all those worries, all those concerns are just going to kind of melt away once we're back in that routine and back working with our with our students. So, um, you know, like, like I said, please, you know, be safe. Please keep that communication open. And, um, you know, I hope you uh, you be well.